This 90s Ford rear end has got like six seasons in the Camaro. I was very surprised to find that it has not been at all. This episode right here, I wanna show y'all exactly how I measured it to determine that. But you see, I've got our composite leaf springs ready to go. I'm gonna put the heavier spring on the right side instead of the left. I know that seems a little crazy, but there's a method to my madness and I wanna explain it. All right, let's get busy. This is pretty easy to do, but there's a couple of things you've got to have right. On the hubs themselves, you need to have them installed and you need to have the lash out of your bearings. And then you need to have it up on jack stands that are supported on the hub if you're not going to do it with the wheel and tire on. So like you see, I've got this up on jack stands and see how that housing is rotating. All right. Now, if you put wheels and tires on it, you can just take another wheel and tire and lay flat on the ground and sit it up on them. And Hammonds, I think, shows a good video of him doing that. But uh, it's the same difference um, as far as doing it. But I, this works just fine. And I like it because it gives you a real clean line for you to measure. Now, what we're doing here is we're gonna measure it at four points going around and we're looking to see that as the housing rotates, does that, does that rotor turn? So if this tube is bent, then as I rotate that tube, that rotor on the bearings there is gonna follow that bend and it's gonna turn. Well, when it turns, a measurement with a tape measure across here will change. So like when I do this, I just start with it straight up, and it's not anything to this at all, y'all. So I'm gonna take it, I'm always gonna keep the straight tape measure straight across the top, and I'm gonna go right in front of this stuff, all right? So when I measure that, I'm 57 and a quarter inches from the outside edge of that rotor to the outside edge of this rotor. And then I'll just turn around, and I'll just go every 90 degrees, and I'm gonna go right there. And again, 57 and a quarter, straight to the bottom, 57 and a quarter, and then across the face, 57 and a quarter. And if that was changing, I would see it according to which way it was bent, I would see it be a smaller number one way and a larger number the other, ideally, you know, opposite of each other. And it was, it was completely straight. I was surprised that this was completely straight. Um, might would have been helpful for the video if it hadn't been where we could have straightened it. But uh, I'm gonna see if I can't find a good YouTube video of somebody who is actually taking a torch and doing the heat. They saturate the heat in a small area and then you can shrink it with a wet rag and make it twist the tube towards that or you can heat out slowly a large area and then let it cool slowly and it'll expand. So I'm gonna see if I can find something like that and put it in the description, a link to it for y'all. Um, because I have never had to do it. I've seen it done um, and it's, it's not hard from what I've seen done, but I'm not gonna sit here and say I've done something that I hadn't done. Anyway, this one is straight, all right? And the question is, well, how much is too much? All right. On the rotor right here, when I'm measuring this, if I had gotten more than a sixteenth of an inch difference, I would be trying to straighten that up, all right? If you're doing it with the tire and wheel assembly on there, and you're going up here across the tread, so from a point on this tread to a point on that tread, double that. And the reason that you wanna double it, so instead of a sixteenth, say if I've got more than an eighth of an inch, that's too much. That would be the same amount of bend, but what it is, is you're twice as far away. So you've doubled your distance out from the center, and so you need to double your number as far as like how much is too much, all right? So we're not talking about it being bent more or less because of it. Um, just that a sixteenth would turn into an eighth of an inch up there. But this thing is ready to go. Oh, that looks good. 
All right, let's get to the good stuff here. So on this Camaro, I am switching up and I'm gonna run the composite right rear spring as the 225 and the composite left rear spring as the 200. And even if I was running stacked steel leafs, I would still be doing this. I'm switching up and putting the stronger spring on the right rear. I've never done this before on a leaf spring car. You know, the way that I've learned it and everything I've done, I've always run my stronger spring by 25 or 50 pounds stronger on the left rear than the right. All right, and so these are the springs I've got and I'm flipping them around. And where is that coming from? I've, over the last year, I've been running my cool car. And you know, if you've been following along on the channel because you're subscribed, y'all are subscribed, right? So on my crate car, I ended up coming up to a 200 pound spring on my right rear. And my right rear got better. It got better as far as me in the middle of the turn and the car becoming more consistent. And listening to Mr. J. Neal with BSB Shocks, I'm a part of Team Go Fast with BSB. And he explained to me that I needed to have enough spring and it would stabilize and the car would hold on the right rear. And he was 100% right. I went up on the spring rate. I'm probably gonna go up some more on that spring rate this year. You know, that spring's job on that right rear is when you go into that turn and you start putting that load into the side of that car, that right rear only compresses so much and it stops and it holds. And so now it's doing its job by being stable. It's created a wheel load and it's gonna be stable and hold it. And the right front, the left rear, and the left front springs and shock. It's their job to do the timing and to do the moving and stuff so that as I, as I navigate through that turn and I exit off, you know, that that car plants that weight back into that left side. I get that, that straight launch off, that, that forward drive. That's their job. The right rear's job, its job is to be that anchor point that holds my wheel load into that tire onto the track. And I agree with it. It's 100% right. No doubt in my mind. Why would it be any different for a leaf spring car? It wouldn't. I think that this is the way that I should be doing it because I believe that I should be taking instead of the car rolling over on the right rear, the sheet metal dragging the ground on the right side of the car. Well, what that's doing is, is as that is moving, it's moving around on that right rear, my wheel loading is fluctuating and it's gonna create that inconsistency. There's no difference in my mind between the leaf and the coil when it comes to that. But then I started looking at it from a standpoint, you know, I'm pretty well knowledgeable about how leaf springs act and what they do. So I looked at it from a standpoint of, what else does that affect and what else is going on? And I realized a few things that I hadn't shared and I wanted to run through this because this is really important. So I did a side view drawing here of a leaf and so like, you know, I drew a composite leaf right here. And if I say you're right, we're weigh 600, 650 pounds. Well, in reality, you know, maybe 200, 250 of that is in unsprung load, you know, wheel, tire, axles, rear end, all of that stuff. You know, and the other 400 is actually in the spring where it's holding the car up. So just keep that in mind. And I was looking at this and I was saying, well, okay, well, I'm gonna go to a stiffer spring, but what's happening anyway on the rear steer and what's gonna change on the rear steer? Well, the rear steer, and I want you to look at this like right around right here. It's about 25 inches on a Camaro spring from the front eye to where that your actual rear end axle is over here, okay? You know, I've done the math on this. I'm gonna give you some rough numbers that are fairly close, but if, you know, at horizon, well, I target horizon, and when I say horizon, in other words, at level, okay? So like if that's level, when I go up or down that first two inches, which is about five degrees, when I say five degrees, imagine like the front of that spring, you know, was a rod. So about five degrees is what two inches of travel is gonna look like. We only change that rear steer amount by one eighth of an inch. One eighth, that's it. Five degrees, two inches up or down, one eighth of an inch, okay? So it's not much, all right? Now, when it goes the second two inches, it actually goes 
to three eighths. All right, and the reason is, is because as that circle sweeps forward, either way, you know, it's more progressive. So it, it'll start sweeping in more as the radius comes around. So you'll go from about one eighth to three eighths if you double from two to four. Well, you're not gonna get to four, okay? Cause you don't have the loading there to do it. But I want you to follow me here on this cause this kind of applies generically across leaf springs. So you can kind of apply these numbers. And so I want you to think about this from a standpoint of I run a big, long bracket, a big, long bracket, um, and I run it like 10 inches, you know, from my upper shackle mount, you know, to my leaf spring, especially on composites because they don't have as much arch in them, all right? And I'm slightly above horizon because this radius line, this orange line right here, it's not the leaf right there. It is the line that goes from the center of where you bolt the eye in to where the actual center of your axle is. That's that line, so it's slightly above the horizon. But what happens is when your right rear compresses, you actually put lead in your right rear. Yeah, you do. Because, and I checked, I checked on my car. So this, this arch is already coming back. I'm past center. I'm coming back up toward the front of the car as it compresses. And it puts lead back in the car. And you know, and two inches, two inches of compression, you know, is roughly gonna be an eighth inch of lead in the right rear. Well, I am not wanting to put lead in the right rear of the car. That's for sure. All right, I'm wanting to put trail if anything, but I'm not gonna be able to put trail. But what I wanna do, I wanna limit that, okay? And I limit that, one way I can limit that is because as I raise, as I raise the back of my Camaro up, so as I get that up above eight inches, you know, in other words, like from the ground up to the eye right here that the front eye of the leaf is in, you know, if I can get that up towards like 10 inches like that, and, I'm, and my rules allow me to run a long shackle back here, then this, this actual leaf itself, I start changing where this radius line is to get it more in line with the horizon. So if I can get that down more towards level, you know, by having the car elevated in the rear like that, I'm changing the roll center in a way that is helping me so that when I compress, so when this compresses, Instead of me being up in the arch here and moving more forward, I'm right in the center, minimizing my lead happening in the right rear. I hope that makes sense, because I am writing all over this board. It's getting really messy, really quick. But anyway, so this is, this is legit. That doesn't matter. Doesn't matter which springs you've got um, or your setup. I mean, this right here, yeah, this is, this is a real thing. And that's happening. I've never realized that up to this point. Um, I'm always learning here and I'm hoping you are too. Um, so I realized that and I said, okay, I got it. So by me putting a stronger spring on the right rear and I'm controlling exactly how much that that loads to, right? So I'm gonna load it to a certain amount. It's gonna stabilize. I'm not gonna have the right rear moving all over the place. Well, by doing that, I'm not gonna have that trail moving all over the place, you know, and if I can get the back of the car up, get that height in it, run a long shackle here, um, then that's going to help me to be right in the center of that arch where that I'm minimizing that amount of trail. Okay. So then turn around and let's talk about the left rear. Okay. Now this is where it really gets interesting. So if I run less spring, on the left rear. So if I'm running a 200 or I might buy a 175, I'm gonna see how it goes. I may actually soften up, put 50 pounds of split difference between these. I think that might actually work even better. We're gonna start with what we got. But if I do that, then I'm gonna have more preload in this spring to start with. The more preload that I've got in the spring to start with, then the more it has an ability to unload and continue to drive the car off of the left rear. And then I can control that timing with shocks. So now that's opening me up to be able to use a left rear shock, a right front shock in order to control how in timing, how that gets applied. 
So if I can get this thing to move, let's just say if I can get this thing to move 600 pounds total, you know, if I can get it to move dynamically three inches, you with me? See why I want to go to a 175? Because if I go to a 175, you know, used to your your rate, you know, it was like you would you would wear your springs out really quick because you're putting your softer spring on your right rear. Well, if I put a stronger if I put a stronger spring instead of a softer spring on my right rear, that might give me some opportunity to put a little bit larger spring on that left rear. You know, so with a 200 pound, I could put 600 pounds of, of weight and if I could move it three inches, and I probably could do that. All right, so let me paint that picture for you. I'm on the scales and let's say I'm on the scales and my left rear is sitting at 900 pounds, all right? That 900 pounds realistically is probably only 650 um, you know, 650 to 700 pounds of actual, you know, load on the spring. Well, that means that that spring is continuing to apply load all the way out, you know, back to the four and a half inch, you know, because a leaf spring is not like a coil. You won't climb off a leaf spring. It'll actually draw negative on you. Y'all know that. You don't fall off of a leaf, okay? You, fall, you, can, you can fall off of a coil spring and the car actually still have drive in it, because you know your lower control arm is creating load in your wheel you know when you're on the engine it's actually creating load in the wheel and you're not going to have that on a set of leaf springs because you can't fall you know you're not going to fall off the leaf it's actually going to pull back away i don't know if that made sense or not i hope it did but uh but anyway point being is is i might be able to get to three inches two and a half two and three quarters three inches on the left rear i would never do that i'd never get there on the right rear and if i did again it would be just all over the place so now if i can do that and the reason that i went all around the world on that right there is because i want to talk about this right here that arc so i'm going in the correct direction for lead in the left rear i can get lead in the left rear I can't get trail in the right rear, but I can get lead in the left rear. And I can tell you that I can start trying to get somewhere more towards, you know, a quarter inch. I'm not gonna get three eighths. I can tell y'all, I'm not gonna get three eighths. But I might be able to get up towards a quarter inch for sure, or past it, you know, in dynamic lead, okay? And so I was realizing this and I was like, you know, it's not just, that switching the springs around helps me as far as stabilizing, but switching the springs around is actually helping me to control my dynamic lead issues that a leaf spring car has from the get-go. All right, now, so if I can get a quarter inch more dynamically of lead, I'm probably gonna put a quarter inch of lead in it to start with. So I'm probably gonna put a quarter inch, you know, of static lead, and then I'm gonna turn around and I've got another quarter inch of dynamic that I'm looking to, to take advantage of, okay? So quarter inch static, quarter inch dynamic. And what am I talking about right there? I'm talking about the measurement right here, you know, and here's how I measure on a stock car. If you know that you have the same control arms on the left and the front, you know, and the right on the lower control arms, and you have not cut the frame up you know, shortened it, turned the frame, done anything like that. You know, if you've got a square car, um, this is how I like to do it. Cause I want to show y'all about setting lead in the car. Um, so I take, and this, and I'm gonna show y'all, let me show y'all how to make this right quick. I want y'all to look right here. Y'all see that loop on the end of that tape measure? This tape measure right here is for one thing. I keep it with me at the racetrack and everything. It's got a little loop right there. And I hook that loop onto my alamite on my lower ball joint from underneath and then i turn around and i go underneath i go right straight under the car underneath the tube to get the measurement and i do it on both sides i use the safe tape measure i'm going to show y'all how to make that because that works you can do it by yourself it's very accurate you don't need to be trying to measure from the hubs of your wheels or anything like that because your caster differences in your front ends is making it look like you've got wheelbase differences 
they don't really exist. That's your caster, okay? That's the lean of the tire. Um, that's not the contact patch of the tire. You know, use the lower control arm because that's actually zero points. Now, if you're on a modified or late model or something like that, then of course you go to like the motor plate or something, but we're talking about stock cars here. You know, that's probably the best place week to week when you're working on your car. Okay, I'm sorry, back to what I was working on. All right, that right there is a cotter pin. All right, so I take a small cotter pin, I take a pair of Nino's pliers, and I open it up to where that, um, a grease fitting, where it'll go over grease fitting, right there on the end, I just stick it through, just like that, and, and I won't do this one, because this tape measure is not for this. I take a pair of Nino's pliers, and I just bend that back around and clamp that down with a pair of Nino's pliers on both sides. And I push it down until it adds one quarter of an inch to the center of that, because that is exactly the spot. Like that's your real perfectly measured wheelbase, you know, is right there. And so that's what I do. It's a, I push it down and I know that when I hook that onto that grease fitting and I pull back and I'm like going across the center of that tube or like on my cool car, I still do like center of the tube. Well, I know that like I'll take whatever that number is and I'll subtract a quarter inch from it and that's what the number actually is. Works really well. That tape measure has been with me for a long time just that. And like I said, I can just hook it on and just as long as I pull on it, I can be at the track or something, I can get under the car, I can just hook into it and pull back there and do it by yourself like that. Um, and that's how I set rear steer on the car. I said I was gonna like actually, I'm not actually going to uh, to set it, I'm gonna leave it at zero uh, because I have to get the car sitting back down on the ground and everything. We gotta go ahead and put the engine in it and everything else before we set the car back down on the ground. So I'm just gonna bolt it all up and leave my U-bolts just a little bit loose and stuff. And then after we get the car fully loaded and sitting on load on the ground and everything, that's when I'm gonna measure that and set that quarter inch of static lead in it. And I hope this makes sense. I think it's gonna make this car drive better. I may have to make some shock changes as well to get this to all work, um, but we're gonna do whatever we got to do. We're gonna make this work, and I think it's gonna be faster. And again, if you're not subscribed, there are tons of videos. I looked the other day, we have got 80 videos. So check us out on the channel. There's tons of setup stuff in the videos and I've got them in playlists. So I've got the crate racing. The crate racing build is about 38 videos. And then I've got about 10 or 11 videos that are just, you know, setups and adjustments and scaling and all of that kind of stuff. And then I've got another playlist I started that's just engine building and everything. We've got a lot of additional information and stuff and we've got some of the blueprints and everything at our, at our website, dirtracelife.com. So check that out. See you next time.